Hello, my name is Gail and I'm the Associate Editor at French Journal. Today I'm very pleased to be speaking with one of our February department authors, Nadine Hoover, who is joining us from New York, Alfred, New York. Hi Nadine, thanks for joining with me today. Thank you, Gail. It's nice to be here. Um, so Nadine, um, she wrote an article called A Decade of Tsunami Relief, and it focuses on um, the work that she's been doing with Friends Peace Teams um, in Indonesia. And the, uh, this is under our service department, uh, which is for subscribers only online. And if you are a print subscriber, of course, it's in the magazine as well. So this service spotlight um, looks at Friends Peace Teams and the work that they've been doing in the wake of the 2004 Indian Ocean uh, tsunami and earthquake, which was hugely devastating to um, many, many people. A lot of people remember this uh, natural disaster and um, the devastation that it caused. Um, so uh, before I get too, too into the article, I do want to say... Um, Nadine is the coordinator of the Asia West Pacific Initiative of Friends Peace Teams, and that is uh, an initiative that sort of started out with, with her work there in the wake of um, this earthquake. Um, so Nadine, why don't we start with, um, uh, actually your, your first sentence of this article uh, is, is a great opener. Uh, Friends are sometimes surprisingly well-equipped to respond to disasters. Um, and, and throughout the article, you detail sort of like three main uh, reasons uh, why, you, why you think that's true. And they all sort of have to do with personal relationships with the people that are in the affected community. Um, so what, why don't you start with, um, with, with that? How did you already have personal relationships with the people in this community? Oh, well, thank you, Gail. I, I think that the first thing, it started with, in 1980, when I first went to Indonesia. I was a student at Friends World College, and one of the premises of Friends World Co College was to learn to use the world as our university. And so we would go out, and there were these data banks of names of people around the world that would take in students. And um, I ended up going to Japan and South Korea and then down to Indonesia. And um, it began there, but also um, I married an Indonesian. I have children from Indonesia, half Indonesian. And I have stayed with it over the years. Um, and during, during the war, there were Achenese who wrote to Peace Brigades International asking us to bring in unarmed bodyguards into the region. And I assisted with that. So the Achenese were quite aware of myself and the people involved with that. And so when, when we went in after the tsunami and they met us in person, many of them said, oh, these are the people who, who kept us alive during the war. Mm -hmm. so they were very grateful and um, very open and very honest, you know. Yeah. The, hit a place where there was a war and after a war people there's not much infrastructure and people aren't very trusting mm -hmm. and so having that level of trust and relationship when we went in made the situation totally different for us than yeah. anybody else I saw there and and I do want to just say that Aceh it was the hardest hit area of of the tsunami and the earthquake is that right the, one of yeah. the hardest hit the earthquake occurred just south of the, the island of Sumatra of Aceh and um, hit um, Aceh within about 15 minutes. The, the southern coast of Aceh lost six to seven kilometers of land into wow. the ocean. It actually cut into the coastline and took the coastline out. So yes, Aceh was the hardest hit area. It was yeah. the closest to the epicenter. Yeah, and, and like you said, they were in the midst already of this war, um, trying to gain independence for themselves from, from Indonesia. Um, so that was your initial connection to them. So now 2004 comes around, uh, the very end of 2004, the, the earthquake hit on December 26. Um, 
So, so how quickly did you go after that? Um, when was your next trip at, right after the, the disaster? Oh, I was there at the end of January. Mm -hmm. We were still picking up bodies off the coastline and stuff like that. Um, but when Peace Brigades International had been accompanying human rights workers in Anche, and in 2003 we got um, kicked out. And so we had taken some Achenese into exile, into Java, and they had come back into Aceh after the tsunami, and they really wanted to go visit their families on the north coast. So I took a drive down the north coast of Aceh with some of these people who were trying to go home and went in. The tsunami pulled around to the north side because the Straits of Malacca were so deep that it pulled out and it came in on the north side and there was no aid there at all. Mm. So we were able to um, go into that area and to set up um, relief in an area where there were no other um, relief services were in East Aceh at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And um, the the second reason you sort of say that friends were were really in a great position to to make a big difference in the recovery efforts here um, were that as friends, you guys spoke openly and directly to people on all sides of the war. You didn't take sides, and um, you say that you act from the friends tradition that you learned growing up in Alfred meeting, um, and and I should say you also. Um, initially went there um, uh, with a minute from this meeting. You were, right? Is that right? Yes, I, I carried a minute from Alfred Friends Meeting and from the village of Alfred, um, and, and I delivered it to village heads everywhere I went. Okay. And they, that was also a very unique kind of thing. You know, um, yeah. I would people around walking around with their clipboards and interviewing everybody and counting people. And I would just sit there until, you know, it was time for evening prayers. And then after the evening prayers, I kind of hand them this little letter from Alfred Friends Meeting. And, yeah. and it, it opened up, we commend Nadine to your care, which is a very, very moving thing. In an, it's the kind of thing they would say in Indonesia. We can, if somebody's traveling, we commend them to your care. And when they say that, they feel like they take responsibility for you. Mm -hmm. So almost immediately it would be like they were taking you into their care. But also it's, you know, as friends, it's really important for us to remember that our main gift in the world is our faith in the living spirit in all people. Mm -hmm. and so there really are no enemies. And there were no other people doing relief services in this area because they said there's a war on. And I'm like, you can go into a war zone if you have permission. And it's actually quite safe. It's a very controlled area. <laughs> they don't have military operations if they know you're there and they know where you are. And so we would report to the Indonesian military. We reported to the independence fighters. We reported to the local village heads. We told everybody, we're here. Do you want us here? Do you need help? And the, and the military commander was like, Actually, we really do. You know, we have this war going on, but there's about 13,500 people who've lost everything in the tsunami, and they're going to starve to death if they don't get help. And so as a commander, he was really caught. He's like, I've got this war I'm supposed to be responsible for. But he said, honestly, we're going to have people starving down at the coast, and that's going to, I don't know what, I, I don't know what to do about this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, we could, you know, we could set up an office. And the thing was, he said, that's fine. That would be good, actually. He said, that would be great. But you would need a military escort. And I knew, I didn't say anything to him, but I knew that the village people wouldn't accept us if we had a military escort. They're at war. Hmm. And so um, you become part of the problem. And I said, well, we're Quakers and we're not allowed to be able to travel with anybody who's armed. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be able to give you a ride and I wouldn't be able to get a ride from you. But what we did was we hired local people from the affected communities and they would come up and they took video and photographs and people would come up from the coastline and they would go down in video and show us what was going on. I didn't travel down in. 
because they're mm -hmm. from the area, they can they can travel in and out with their ID cards without a military escort. So we just found ways to work with everyone, and uh, you know, every side has lots of different kinds of people thinking lots of different kinds of things, wishing. There's always somebody on every side that's wishing for something better. Right. So it's really never so simple as saying there's two sides. <laughs> oh, no. Right. There's, there's multiple motives on both sides. And, and, and I did want to mention um, the tradition that you learned growing up in, in Alfred, and you say this in your article, take no sides, make no enemies. That's right. I once, you know, when Vietnam was closed after the war, no one was allowed in, not even the International Red Cross. The only people that were in Vietnam were, were the Quakers. And I once asked a government, a Vietnamese government official after they opened up Vietnam, why did you allow us to stay? And they said, that's because you're the only ones that we can trust that actually do what you say you're doing. And that when you say you're taking no sides, you actually don't. Go Quakers. And I, I th I, it's so powerful. That, and I ha we see it over and over again. And that we, we do what people, most people call impossible. Hmm. They say, oh, that's not possible. Hmm. And why? How can you do the impossible? Well, it's because we talk to everyone. You can't have peace without everyone. Mm -hmm. You can't have peace just with your side. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that and that takes a lot of time and patience yeah. and effort and it's not going to happen overnight. And so you really have to put in that time because that's the only way you can build a relationship. There's no shortcut to building a, a trustworthy strong relationship with with these kinds of people. Yeah. Kins Kins, a human rights uh, attorney and environmental activist in in the Philippines traveled with me last month mm -hmm. in Indonesia. And that's what she, she looked around and she watched what we were doing and she said, there's no way you could accomplish the things you're accomplishing if you didn't have these long-term trusting relationships. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. People, she said, it's really clear that people actually trust you. And, you know, th this is a really important thing. I, I it, Sometimes it's hard to put into words, but it's about the sincerity of our faith. Do we actually believe that peace is possible? Yeah. Do we actually believe that there is that of God in everyone? Everyone. Mm -hmm. That no matter who you approach, no matter what you know about them, you can touch that core self in them. You can touch that of God within them. You can call that out and you can name that together. Do we believe this? You know, um, yeah. and I can tell you that the sincerity of that belief, you cannot pretend. People will know. Right. Or else, I mean, it wouldn't be sincere. That's the, that's the And you can feel definition. it. It's yeah. Helpful. You know, it's just a really present, palpable thing. And that power is amazing and we get to witness miracles every day. Miss mm -hmm. Miss Lan, Lan up in the refugee camps outside of uh, Aceh, he said, you know the word strange is strange because you hardly ever hear it. But except when Friends Peace Teams is here and then you hear it almost every day. <laughs> strange but true. You know that's strange that that's possible but it's true. <laughs> you know so that's amazing. It's that's one great. present to miracles every day. Yeah. Um, and so the, the last point I want to bring up is um, that as friends, you guys brought a practical approach to, to helping in the wake of, of this um, natural disaster. And you say this in the article, we understand that very often help does not help. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean by that? Um, yeah, what do you mean? If you know that people, if there's that of God in everyone, if you know that the spirit is present and palpable and people are good and capable, they may be in distress. And if they're actually drowning, it's good to actually rescue them. But you can't rescue people from their own lives, mm -hmm. right? But we all need companionship. We need to visit one another. We have a film on our website at um, the fptawp.org site under activities called Silaturami, mm -hmm. the power of visiting. 
And Silatu Rami in Islam is, is a requirement for spiritual community. So we can cross across Christian, Islamic, Buddhist, Hindu, other communities, and they understand that power of visiting. And they say, Misan says in the film, they, they visit like family, not with an agenda or a program, but just like family, you sit down and talk about the practical things going on, and you rise to that occasion, and you help each other think them through, and you respond the best you can. I, in the letter, the travel minute that I carried from my meeting, there's a quote that they, they always pointed to when they read it. It's that she brings with her our faith in the living spirit to bring um, life, joy, peace, and prosperity, mm -hmm. love, integrity, and compassionate justice among people who live in, in, in equality, integrity, simplicity, and nonviolence. Yeah. And they would always point to that and say, that? Do you know how to do that? Mm. And I would say, yes, we actually do. That's what we care about. That's what we do. So much of what we do is uh, the training from the Alternatives to Violence Project basic workshop in nonviolence. And we've extended that into training in resiliency and developmental play and liberation, uh, the liberty of conscience and discernment. And they just think this is wonderful. But, you know, it's really, really basic things. Like I put up on the mirror of the hair salon in Alfred that we needed six dolls. Because kids who live in a war zone, they don't, they don't know how to play. They don't have anything. They don't have dolls and stuff like that. And they don't know what to do with them if they had them. Well, my community said, we could, the meeting and a whole lot of people said, we could, we can make dolls. So they sewed 309 dolls. Wow. And we, I took suitcases of dolls up this mountain. Mm -hmm. and, um, and because we went up there and because we're attending you know, regularly. We go back twice a year um, just to check in and see mm -hmm. how things are going and say hello. And because of that, when things happen, we're there. And we were able to hook them up with an Amnesty International campaign when they were being attacked and hook them up with, with uh, the Norwegian embassy when the, when the palm oil plantations were after them. And Nor Norway pulled back a billion US dollars from this area because of the abuse of power in the area. And now they're the refugees in North Sumatra are under attack again and we're helping hook them up with other activists in the region. We're hoping to get them land claims this year. But it's not because we have a program or a project to get them land claims. It's because we visit. Mm -hmm. and we say, oh, look at what's happening. Well, we know so and so. We can write a letter. We can help hook up these resources for you. It's a, just a really Mm, it's an amazing opportunity that we as friends have in the world and I really hope that we learn to take the time to come. You know, you don't have to go to lots of places. Go to one place. Go to one place and get to know them and learn from them. I think mm -hmm. we, we can't know ourselves unless we know others. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, there's a little story in the article about I was sitting there with these people up in the mountains in Aceh. And I had like just a few hundred dollars from these students in the United States. And they're like, they're, they're supporting families on 50, 60, $70 a month. Mm -hmm. and, and so they're saying, well, we'll spend two, $20 for this, a few dollars for that. But this $120 you take back and you use it for the movement of conscien conscience in the United States. I'm like, well, it was kind of hard to get the money here. <laughs> Uncle really wanted it to help you. Yeah. So maybe we could save it until you know what you need. And they looked at me like they, I was crazy. And they said, there's nothing, nothing in the world that would make our lives better than a movement of conscience against war and, and violence in the United States. And they are very aware. They have paid. You know, our military budgets are destroying just destroying so much. We can't spend the amount of money we're spending every year on training people in violence and not expect that to come back to us. Mm. It was when the U.S. trained people, soldiers in Vietnam, to go by villages and do random shooting that that terrorized people so much that it improved our effectiveness. It was after that that we got drive-by shootings in the United States. You know, we can't train people to go out there in the world and proliferate horrific uh, acts against other people and not expect it to come back to us, mm -hmm. you know. And we know 
we know how, I mean, we're bringing whole communities back from extreme violence. We know how to establish peace. It's just a question about whether we're going to actually believe it and invest in it. So, I, you know, as a conscientious objector to war, I think it is really, the time has come to make war illegal. That's what I believe. And I think it sounds as crazy today as, as it must have sounded saying it's time to make slavery illegal. Hmm. But war is the preemptive use of violence for your, own, for your own benefit. How can that be okay? It's just not okay. We should have treated 9-11 as a crime. I, I had been working in the Madras in Southeast Asia for eight years when 9-11 when hit. And I tell you, the whole we didn't have any enemies. The, world, the Ber Berlin Wall had come down. And the world would have united. The Islamic world would have united with us. They were so horrified by what happened. And if we had treated like that like a crime, the whole world would have come behind us. Mm. There was no reason to, to start except for whoever profits from wars. There's no reason to, yeah. to use war as the mechanism for... Well, certainly a, I know a lot of Quakers that would agree with you <laughs> that there's a large community that also take on that belief. Um, and we've had a lot of articles related to that, um, especially against the, the anti-war one. Um, there is a, a whole feature article in, in the February issue as well on um, war tax resistance. Yeah, did you see that one? It was excellent. It's yeah. an excellent article. Yeah, there you go. I was very pleased. <laughs> okay. Well, Nadine, thank you so much for sharing so much of your, your wisdom and experience here. Um, I really appreciate it. And we'll have links to Friends Peace Team's um, website and all the work that you guys are doing um, into that film you mentioned earlier in the show notes um, in this video. So, readers... We're traveling, can, oh, we're yeah. traveling in Indonesia, in Nepal, in the Philippines. Yeah. Some Filipinos are hoping to go down in... There's a friends meeting in the Philippines, and some of them are hoping to, to go down into Mindanao. Um, there are friends in Australia. So, if you're wanting to travel with a concern for peace in Southeast Asia or anywhere in Asia mm -hmm. and the Pacific... Um, please get a hold of us and we would um, yeah. do that. We do an international regional training, peace training in central Java in January, February, and early in the year each year. So if anybody would like to come for that, we have Peace Place in central Java where you can come and sojourn. There's a preschool and an after school program and a parenting program based on the AVP nonviolence training. So you're always welcome. Anybody's welcome to come and stay at Peace Place for a while. And awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so many opportunities. A lot of work going on. Yeah, so readers can check out Nadine's article, A Decade of Tsunami Relief, in the February issue. And there's um, photos on our website as well. Um, and that is subscriber-only content. So you got to join us if you want to read it. Um, it's an excellent, excellent article. And also just a little reminder that um, we do have department pieces in almost every issue. And those are the, the shorter ones in the back of the issue um, that are about, you know, less than a thousand words or so. And we really like the uh, unique perspectives that authors can bring to those and when you're not tied to a theme. So uh, if you have an idea for a department article, please let us know and reach out. Okay, Nadine, thanks so much for talking again, and um, hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, Gail, and thank you to everybody who's listening. I really appreciate the time. Awesome. Bye. Bye-bye.